Welcome back to another episode of the Personal Trainers Who Care podcast. I'm your host, Vanya Howe, COO and personal trainer at Waveform Fitness. Each episode, I meet with one of our personal trainers, clients, or other health and fitness professionals for an in-depth discussion on various health and fitness topics in order to help you live your life a little bit better. In today's episode, I sit down with one of our newest members of our Canada location team, Mark Wilkinson. I'm really excited to introduce Mark to everybody because I really don't think there's any other personal trainer out there who has his background. Mark has been involved in sports his entire life. He even spent a few years as a top junior tennis player. He was also a dancer and he's been involved in acting and singing. His experience in the performing arts led him to pursue a PhD in the fields of music, speech, and hearing science. From there, Mark became a professor teaching university level courses, as well as providing one-on-one -on -one coaching to professional actors, singers, and public speakers. In today's episode, Mark and I talk about how he uses his knowledge and experience with the voice and voice health to help his clients and fellow trainers improve their overall health. Now, before we get to my conversation with Mark, I invite you all to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already to stay notified about any future episodes. It'll also help us reach more people so that we can keep sharing our knowledge and expertise. Our goal is to reach 1,000 subscribers. Thanks again for your support. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mark. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Vanya. We're uh, really excited to have you joining our Canada team. Thank you. Especially since you have such a wide experience that, you know, I don't know if any other personal trainer would, would have. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm really interested to learn more about your personal uh, expertise and, and background and how you kind of intend on weaving that into your work with clients. And uh, yeah, I'm personally excited to, to learn something new. Thank you. As well. Thank you. You know, even though I've been in this a personal trainer for for a little over ten years now, um, in my view, there's there's no shortage of things that you can learn, right, and, and be better at, at our craft. So, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. One of the best things about being a personal trainer is that half of personal training is teaching. In mm -hmm. fact, I'd say more than half of it is teaching. Yeah. And the only way you can be a teacher is if you continue to learn. Oh, for sure. Right. To make sure that learning is occurring, that's what teaching is. Mm -hmm. There's so much more than just teaching. So for you to say that you want to keep learning is exciting for me to hear <laughs> joining the team because as a teacher, I want to keep learning because it's the only way that I can keep teaching. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Prior to joining us, um, you know, you, you've been a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, a voice teacher mm -hmm. in particular. Yeah. So, yeah, one thing that uh, we're going to be talking about today is the larynx mm -hmm. and how to use our voice and how that kind of yeah. impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. because yeah this is admittedly something that I have zero knowledge on and like you were saying you know we're not really taught this at all in you know anatomy classes and you mentioned that physiotherapists other health professionals really have no idea what to do with the larynx um, but you were saying there's there's a lot that we can do right the larynx is an incredibly strong organ. Uh -huh. And before you know it, it can do a lot of the lifting for you in the gym if you're right. not careful. And I always ask people to imagine that they're lifting a piano. Uh -huh. <coughs> mm. And all of yeah, a sudden yeah. you hear that closing of the vo vocal cords. Right. And you know, oh wow, I'm doing a lot from my neck. But if you actually ask people to <sighs> exhale while they mm. do something, all of a sudden the body gets a lot more efficient. Oh, and yeah. already in the time I've been with Freeform, when I remind clients of that exhale yeah. as they move through, they go, oh, that was easier. Mm -hmm. Because the form improves, mm -hmm. the coordination of the body, that flow state that we talk a lot yeah. about in yeah. both personal training and yoga, are just already there. So yeah. absolutely, the larynx is the undersung hero yeah. of the human body. And as you said, I've talked to chiropractors and physios and PTs and people who know so much about the body. Yeah. But when I talk about the voice and the larynx, they kind of go, yeah. oh, I have, I have no idea. So it's almost like in anatomy and physiology, we kind of skip from yeah. here to here. Right. right. We talk a lot about neurological connections, motor control, biomechanics, but then we kind of skip the neck and go to the rest of the mm -hmm. body, to the whole systems. But the larynx is so important mm -hmm. for the process of respiration. Yeah. So yeah. 
I would love to offer to Freeform and to any personal trainer who's interested, to be honest, more information about that connection for the larynx and yeah. how the larynx is mostly innervated by the vagus nerve, right? Mm -hmm. The vagus nerve, the one we talk a lot about, getting into that parasympathetic state, that one that relaxes us. Yeah. Well, you can't use the voice without the vagus nerve. Right. So they're one and the same. So to use your voice is to relax. Right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so if this, what maybe yoga teachers would call throat chakra, for example, is open and receiving that breath in and out, naturally the inhale, the exhale is coming in and out, you're going to be so much more ready mm -hmm. to receive the exercises that you're being given. Mm -hmm. So I really, all that to say, I just think the larynx hopefully will not be so forgotten no. <laughs> from now on. Yeah, yeah, and we all know the importance of breathing and, and how to breathe properly when you're lifting, particularly something, something super heavy. But yeah, I didn't realize the, the connection between the breath and the larynx and, and how that could play a role. And the way that I always remind people to think of it is if you're talking, mm -hmm. do you think about how much you breathe when you talk? No. Not normally. Yeah. When you're walking down the street, you're walking from your car to the door, mm -hmm. you're not actively breathing. Mm -hmm. But if you weren't breathing, obviously, you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing. <laughs> but then we go to do things, whether it's singing, acting, lifting weights, whatever it may be, and all of a sudden we go, okay, from the diaphragm, and we start to think yeah. about breathing. Yeah. But the larynx is actually the reason that you can just breathe without thinking about it. Because the larynx, one of its major functions mm -hmm. is to regulate airflow between the upper and lower respiratory tracts. Okay. And thankfully, of course, just like we don't have to think about breathing when we sleep, <laughs> yeah. the diaphragm does naturally descend and ascend as you inhale and exhale. But how much air we know to take mm -hmm. comes from the larynx and its mm. connection to the brain. And if you know you're going to say, hi, you don't need to go, ah, hi. You don't have to take such a big inhale for one word. Right. So our speech is actually constantly regulated by the larynx based on how much breath we just naturally know we need. Mm -hmm. So how do we coordinate that sense, that natural sense of breath, when we're becoming more aware of it? Yeah. That's really the trick. So it's just, it's an amazing organ made up of tiny, tiny little involuntary muscles that again, even a lot of health professionals wouldn't be able to name, no. <laughs> which is all good. And yet it's so important for everything that we do. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. How exactly does the larynx do all that? Mm -hmm. And how can you tell if there's any issues that, that someone may have with their larynx? A lot of it is in the quality of their voice. Mm -hmm. You can hear a lot from people's voice. You can also hear a lot about their emotional state in their voice. Oh. And it's probably something that even people who wouldn't call themselves actors can recognize. Yeah. So if you know, you ask me how I am and I go, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You would kind of go, well, I don't know if I believe you. You know what I mean? There's a sense that even in the way the voice rings, there's something there that says, oh, you said you're okay, but I don't believe that. Yeah. The other thing that you can hear is a certain amount of tension in the voice too, if there's a lot of muscular effort going on in the voice. Right you know that those chords are coming together, not necessarily smoothly, not through that flow state, but because something else has been pushing them together, right? Because mm -hmm. there's internal muscles to the larynx and there are external muscles of the larynx. Mm -hmm. The most famous one for us being the sternocleidomastoid, the big yeah. strap muscle, right? Yeah. But all of the muscles of the neck, many of the jaw, many under the chin, those are called external muscles. And then we have all the little internal muscles that actually work together to make sound. Ah, e, a, a, o, u, right? So the coordination of those internal and external muscles is really, really important. And the other way you can tell is if you just listen to someone's breath while they're doing mm -hmm. an exercise, if they're lifting themselves up and you hear, uh, yeah. then you know there's a constriction right. going on, which means that the cords aren't actually open to allow for breath to flow, but the muscles of the neck have sort of forced the, the vocal cords half closed. Mm -hmm. So you get that strident or strider, as we call it, that yeah. strider sound of uh. yeah. So it's visual and it's auditory. Because right. you can often see someone lifting something and you just see their neck yeah, muscles just yeah. completely, all the strap muscles just totally engaging. But if we're lifting something from the legs, that might not be what we're looking for. So it becomes a sort of observational thing where I look at the whole body 
and I look at the amount of effort from head to toe. Yeah. Yeah. And so often, once you become aware of it, you realize how much energy is taking place oh, yeah. at the level of the neck, which, while we think of it obviously as the external muscles, mm -hmm. affects the internal muscles of the larynx, yeah. which is why something that we're really interested in in my other life, as I call it, the yeah. voice world, yeah. my other life, is voice damage for people who lift heavy weights a lot. Mm -hmm. And not only for people who lift heavy weights, but for personal trainers who both lift heavy weights and talk all day. Yeah. How do you demonstrate to your clients a healthy way to lift while talking? Mm -hmm. Or even if you're not talking while you demonstrate, if you've been doing a lot of lifting weight and then you're just talking all day to your clients, that's a lot of use of your larynx. Oh yeah. And because so many people don't have that awareness, they don't know what they've got till it's gone, right? Yeah. The old Joni Mitchell song, right? It's just, until you lose your voice, you don't know what you've got. And so, so often when I work with people, because people often think I just work with actors and singers, quite the contrary. I work with teachers, conductors, call center workers, right? Lawyers who talk in court all day. There are all kinds of people who have never thought about taking care of their voice until yeah. they lose it. So a lot of my work and what I hope to offer today is really that prevention, mm -hmm. that pre-work, which is sort of very analogous to what we do as personal trainers. Mm -hmm. The better we can get our clients to move their bodies now, the less likely they are to be injured and the less likely they are to need rehab. Right. So we talk a lot about rehabilitation, but in the same way that a personal trainer does it, I see the voice work as being habilitation. Mm -hmm. We don't need to wait for the re, <laughs> right? Why wait for the re of rehabilitation? Just start with habilitation. Yeah. So a lot of my work is about educating people on the voice, how to take care of the voice, how to warm up their voice, what coffee and alcohol do to your voice, what a lack of sleep does to your voice, what various foods do to your voice. And before you know it, you've convinced a whole bunch of people, oh wow, I'm a voice user. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a professional voice user. If you talk all day, you are a professional voice user. Yeah. Just because you don't think of yourself as a you know, voiceover character actor or, or a singer, singer yeah. it doesn't matter. If you talk all day, you are a professional voice user. Mm -hmm. But people don't often think of that. And then when that reframe happens, they become much more interested in those processes that take care of the voice before they lose it. <laughs> yeah, you, you throw so much at me, I don't know where to start. Okay. <laughs> I'll go wherever you want to go. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, but for me, I guess personally, in addition to talking to clients all day long using my voice, mm -hmm. um, I've actually started using my voice in a different way because just before Christmas, I decided to buy myself a ukulele. Nice. So I've been learning how to play that, mm -hmm. and I've somehow managed to figure out how to sing and play at the same time. Nice. Songs. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not ready to perform yet. But <laughs> <laughs> just on my own time at home, you know, I am singing a lot more yep. and practicing my, my ukulele playing. And uh, yeah, I've noticed you know, changes in, in mm -hmm. stuff, in how this area of my body feels. Um, so yeah, for, for somebody who hasn't trained as a singer and is just kind of like singing on their own, uh, what kind of potential issues do you see happening? Um, because yeah, I'm, I'm obviously not doing any like vocal warm-ups, I'm not <laughs> doing anything that a professional singer would do to prepare myself mm -hmm. to, to sing, uh, an activity that I'm definitely not, not used to or trained in. Yeah. So I'm sure I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> something. <laughs> not quite right. <laughs> sure. Well, the answer to your question is actually in your question. Mm -hmm. you, you really just hit on it. It's about reframing the use of your voice mm -hmm. as having a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right. In the exact same way that we train the body. Because what is the voice but part of the body? It's as much of a group of muscles, cartilages, and a big bone at the top that needs care and preparation. You said the word prepare. Yeah. So it's that idea. We don't walk into a gym cold. Mm -hmm. And if we do, we have to take five minutes out of our session to warm up. Yeah. Same thing. If we start the voice cold, we're not going to be able to last as long. During the middle, the actual doing of the voicing. 
same thing, physical adaptation. Right. And then the parallels to personal training are just amazing, right? Yeah. It really is. You are training the voice to get used to doing something for a longer period of time in a new way. Mm -hmm. Exactly what we do with our clients as personal trainers. And so at first, there's two kinds of fatigue. There's fatigue from misuse, and there's fatigue from just having not used it that way before. Mm -hmm. If we weren't a little bit tired after the gym, we wouldn't have worked our muscles very much, right? There is a certain level of fatigue that comes from training the body. Mm -hmm. And the same is going to be true of the voice. Now, pain, that's a different conversation. Yeah. We're not looking for pain, of course, same thing in the gym. But getting your body used to a new way of using your voice will take time. And so I know we throw terms around like linear periodization and physical adaptation for personal training. It's the exact same thing with the voice. You have to do your rudiments. Just like when you learn the piano, you play your scales over and over and over before you can get to the next level. It's the exact same thing with the voice. So for you, you're going to find that a proper voice warm-up in the way that you would warm up your body, mm -hmm. paying attention to how you use your voice, which is the middle, right? Mm -hmm. The bulk of the work, which is the actual singing itself, that's the technique. And then after that is the cool down, mm. which is sort of like stretching at the end of a PT session. Right. So as you can see, <laughs> using the voice and personal training are actually very, very similar. But just because it's not a bicep curl or a squat doesn't mean that it's not an organ in your body made of muscles, cartilages, and a bone. Mm -hmm. Same thing is, is at play. So you kind of answered your question yeah. because you were already recognizing, oh, I need to prepare. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get used to something and I need to know what to do with it after I use it. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is getting to know some very basic warm-ups and then getting to know your technique how to use the voice in a way that is very similar to how we lift a weight. Enough tension so that there is sound occurring, but not so much tension that it moves into the area of strain where uh, we're pushing the voice out, which is exactly what we don't want to do with muscles. So when you train something, just do it. Keep doing it mm -hmm. and you will get better. Yeah. But if we do it with bad technique over and over and over, that's when injury can happen. That's when something, you know, people, even if they don't think they know the voice, maybe they've heard of nodules, voice nodules, which is what Julie Andrews had when she right, lost yep. her voice, that very famous story. Even someone with that kind of career, with overuse, can come injury. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how good your form is, you're not supposed to work out eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. So no matter how good my technique may be as a speaker and a singer, I shouldn't be speaking and singing for eight hours a day either. It's the exact same thing. So what you're also dealing with is that now combination of physical activity, of the speaking for a living, and now adding singing, you're already gonna be a little bit fatigued mm -hmm. from your job and right. from your day-to-day -day life. So just in the way that we ask our clients to think about how they're incorporating this added workout into their life, because I had a client once, for example, I'd already run for like an hour before she saw me. So of course, her workout was really tiring. Yeah. Same thing with the voice. If you've been talking all day and then you go home and sing for another hour, you're going to be tired. Mm -hmm. There is a certain amount of good technique and warming up that will cure that, but then there is a certain amount that won't. Because at the end of the day, a group of muscles that are too tired to function are too tired to function. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. What I'm hearing is <laughs> I probably need uh, some rest days in between my, my ukulele practicing, which my husband will thank you for that. Advice. You know, husband, you're welcome. <laughs> husband, you're welcome. Absolutely. And that's it because, you know, if we work out, because, you know, the gym, if you start to love it, can be really addictive. Mm -hmm. You see the gains, you see the muscle growth, you get really into it. But if you work out seven days a week, eventually that's going to run out. Yeah. The fuel tank is going to run out. It's the exact same thing with the voice. I love my clients who love to sing every day. And I say, yes, but do you take some time to let those muscles, because we can forget that it's made up of tiny little muscles. Because mm -hmm. remember, your vocal cords are the size of your a pinky fingernail. Okay. How small they are. And yet, oh, they can do these amazing big sounds, right? Yeah. Those need a break. 
especially because we use a lot of those external muscles for weightlifting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a lot of us really want big shoulders and a big neck, you know, all those things. Well, in there is how is that larynx? Right. So you will find that with rest, with proper practice and proper technique, those physical adaptations will occur. Mm -hmm. Stamina will come. You'll find your balance. How much did I talk today? Okay, I should probably only sing for maybe 20 minutes today. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? I didn't have many clients today. My voice is feeling better. Maybe I can sing for an hour today. And you start to incorporate, just as we ask our clients to do with their workout, you incorporate the right amount of voicing, as we call it. Because yeah. voicing can be speech, singing, a little bit in between, <laughs> depending on what you're doing. How much voicing can I put in my day? How much voice do I have left? Mm. So you'll find your balance. Okay. You will. Yeah. Just like the gym. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I could draw these parallels all day, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, well, enough about me and my singing. Oh, but, okay. Uh, yeah, so let's <laughs> bring this back to uh, our work with our clients. Yeah. So something that, that I've noticed is a lot of people do have that tension in their neck muscles, right? Which, you know, I've partly attributed to just being at a desk all day, hunched over in this position. Right, so now if somebody is really tense in mm -hmm. their external mm -hmm. uh, neck muscles, does it always correlate with uh, issues internally? Mm. It depends on our ability to assess that. And what I mean by that is the average person is talking at a level and a volume that doesn't require them to have a lot of voice. Mm. It's easier to find that out in people who use their voice professionally all day and have excess strain in the external muscles of the larynx, which are just essentially the neck muscles. Yeah. And so it doesn't always correlate, but that's often because we don't know. Because mm -hmm. the amount of talking we may hear from our client with the hellos and goodbyes before the session aren't really long enough to assess what's going on you would need to put them through a little bit more range work to sort of see how the range is affected by that. Right. How much tension is required when they project their voice, whereas here, they don't need to project their voice too much because they're just saying hi to us at the desk. Yes. So it doesn't always correlate, but what I would say is it probably correlates even more than we may know to the naked ear. Because mm -hmm. we're not putting people through voice work yes. other than hello and checking in with them, letting us know how they're feeling today or whatever it is. But if I took some people who have a lot of tension yeah. in those neck muscles and asked them to, you know, extend their range a little bit through just, you know, la 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 la, just something very simple like that, all of a sudden that would reveal the lack of flexibility, mm -hmm. the lack of range. And so often when people want to learn how to sing, they say, I want to get a bigger range. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always correlate. But it sure can. It could, yeah. Oh, and, and not only could, it can yeah, yeah. and does yeah. for sure. So it just depends on, on the client. It depends on, and that, I mean both my voice clients and my PT clients. It depends yeah. on what they're doing. And from the first year of my undergraduate degree as a voice major, they warned us, careful about how often you're in the gym. Mm. Careful how you're lifting. And so this is something that the voice world knows about. But I'm asking the PT world now to know, uh, you know what I mean? I need yeah. the voice in the PT worlds to know that about each other. Because the voice world has always been much more interested in that idea of weightlifting and what that can do to the larynx. And so my hope is to bring that knowledge to the PT world so that it can be as aware of the voice as the voice is of weightlifting. Does right. that make sense? Oh, for sure. So that we're talking to each other. Yeah. Because that research that we do into the damage that can be done to the voice, we need us as exercise physiologists to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. That needs to be a part of it so that everybody's involved. So that if somebody who is maybe a speech pathologist but who doesn't have that exercise background, you, you for example, could help with understanding that language. Right. Okay, so I see the damage being done to the voice and here's what I'm noticing in the muscles. So then you're working together all of a yeah. sudden. So it's definitely something that I would love to see and is, I mean, just ripe for research. I mean, oh, yeah. it's just absolutely ripe for research. We've done basic research to know that when you hold the cords closed, like I said earlier, <laughs> to, to try to squeeze out an extra set, yeah. we know that's not good for the voice. Mm. But 
there's much more work to be done on the nuance of that, the different kinds of voice, right? Because certain people have lighter, softer voices. Some people are big people, they've got big honking voices, you know, so they have a little more stamina because they just have more muscle mass to their vocal cords. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people have a lot less muscle mass to their vocal cords. And there's a big difference between male and female vocal cords as well, right? Mm -hmm. Transgender people who are transitioning as well, they're experiencing a change to their voice as well. So where do they fit into exercise? I mean, there are so many avenues yeah. that we could go in taking care of people's voices, especially as they relate to their identity. Because as I said, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone? No. And before you know it, people don't realize how much their identity was invested in their voice until mm -hmm. they don't have it. So it's, it's something that I talk to people about, something that I ask my clients. How do you feel about your voice? Yeah. What would happen if you couldn't use it anymore? So I'm really excited to see if those worlds can't talk a little bit more to each other. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. So what you're saying is... <laughs> We should include vocal warm-ups in our warm-ups with our uh, training sessions. <laughs> PTs should. <laughs> PTs yeah. who talk yeah. all day should oh, yeah. absolutely uh -huh. warm up their voices. Yeah. Our clients... Yeah. While we're doing our bear crawls, we'll just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, just do some of those. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's amazing to me to hear personal trainers speak. Yeah. And how they speak in the gym. Especially because often we have music playing in the gym. Yeah. Multiple people in the gym. And I'm just always sort of have that sixth sense for how are people getting their voice into the room mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Because one of the least, one of my least favorite words is projection. Yes. Project your voice. Because that's just akin to yelling. Yeah. <laughs> and I can just get people to yell. And so one of the things that I've enjoyed doing is with my colleagues in the yoga world is giving them voice workshops. Okay. How do you... Again, I don't like the word project, so I'll say, how do you carry your voice mm -hmm. into the room for a whole hour, if not hour and a half yoga class in a way that's healthy and won't make you lose your voice? Mm -hmm. There's so many connections there for me. And um, the other connection that I would make is in a world of PT that has been known, mm -hmm. I don't judge it, but it has been known for a certain kind of guy that's supposed to work out. Mm -hmm. The male identity in the gym has been one that's been very interesting to people for a long time. And not just in PT, but just in Western society in general, our expectations of how men are supposed to behave right. and sound can make them really try to like, yeah, 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 I'm a, I'm a dude. Yeah, 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 I talk like, and, and there can be a lot of pressure on the larynx and a lot of suppression of the air we suppress our air when we're suppressing our emotions mm -hmm. because it is our air that carries our emotions out into the world. And so when we don't want to share our emotions, we suppress that air. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of identity factors there for me too. And I'm always particularly curious about male PTs, but also what that does about how female PTs mm -hmm. think they're supposed to sound. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, as you know, we have seen really interesting studies about women identifying people who sort of masculate their voices because they're surrounded by right. men. You know what I mean? So we're really curious in STEM fields about how men use their voices, but how women use their voices based on being in very male-dominated fields. Mm -hmm. So there's so much involved for me. It's not just biological, it's also psychosocial as well. Right. What are our perceptions of our voices based on our culture, based on our identity, based on our background, and based on the people that we surround ourselves with? And so women in those STEM fields have often reported adding what we call vocal fry. Now vocal fry is that thing you do where you kind of start to talk like that. Uh, yeah. We all get a little bit lazy at the end of our sentences. Yeah. But we've noticed women really do that in typically, you know, air quotes, typically male-dominated fields they'll do that to kind of emasculate their voices a little bit, mm -hmm. to, to, to pitch their voices lower. But mm -hmm. the problem is, is that if I talk like this, that's just rubbing chords together that yeah. aren't actually vibrating. Right. And until we actually have mm, oh, actual vibration to the chords, we don't want to be rubbing them together, which is exactly why <laughs> when, you, when you slam them together, but they're not vibrating, you're just rubbing chords together, yeah. nodules, polyps, all sorts of things can occur. Mm -hmm. 
So excuse me, it's a long answer, yeah. but it's it's there's so much to this for me that yeah. until you sort of come from my world, you don't really think about. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting now that I think about it and how you framed it as we're all voice users, right? So yep. as something that we all do on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, it's it's just interesting to me that there's actually very little research done. <laughs> when a P, when a PT gets a cold, uh -huh. we can't work. Yeah. So our health is very important to us. What's the first thing that tells us we're getting better? When we start to sound like ourselves. Mm -hmm. Totally unconsciously, you're a voice user. Yeah. It's one of the very first indicators that we have available to us to say, oh, I feel like myself usually when you sound like yourself. Right. And you have a cold and all nasally and stuffy and you don't feel like yourself. Your voice says so much about feeling like yourself. Yeah. And so voice health is really important to me also from a longevity and business standpoint for PTs. Mm -hmm. For any PTs listening to this, if we want to make sure we're never missing days because we lose our voice, we might want to start thinking about our voice health as much as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because that's our communication method for the most for the most part and of course not to be ableist there are people who don't have their voices and we have ways of working with them and there are people who don't have their sight and we have ways of working with them I don't mean to exclude anybody from this conversation but generally speaking huh, pardon the pun generally speaking that voice is our communication tool and we don't feel really able to connect with our clients when we're sick or we've lost our voice so it's a huge indicator for me that maybe voice health should be considered a little more. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some things that we can do to take care of our voice? Love it. This is what we call voice hygiene. Mm -hmm. Voice hygiene is a field that looks at those prehab or just habilitation things that we can do to take care of our voice. So, the first thing is if you're able if you can afford a house right now, if you because things are crazy right now with you know the rental market out there. If you're so lucky to have a house and you have a warm bed to sleep in, try to get some sleep. Mm -hmm. Recovery for the body is recovery for the voice. Yeah. When I get a really good sleep, I wake up and mm, the voice is just right there. So much less of a warm up has to occur when you're already rested. Speaking of warm-up, before you do even a voice warm-up, do a physical warm-up. Moving your body, going for a walk, getting some sunshine, doing 10 minutes of yoga, stretching routine, whatever it is, because this is housed within a whole bunch of muscles. Anything you can do to get the body open and stretched and feeling like it's in that flow state, your larynx is going to be able, more able to relax. Right. So I always say that. Good sleep, move your body. Next thing, stay hydrated. Water, water, water. We've all had that dry voice feeling. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you stay hydrated. One of the really interesting things, though, is that you can also give yourself a really chewy breakfast. By chewing and creating all of that saliva, and every time you swallow, the larynx goes up and then it goes down. Then you swallow, it goes up and then it goes down. So the larynx is literally involved in swallowing because what the larynx does is it protects the airway from food getting down it, right? You've ever had that feeling that, oh, it went down the wrong way? Mm -hmm. That's because the epiglottis right behind the tongue goes back and the cords close to cover the trachea because the larynx is over the windpipe. So just, you know, having a bagel, something really chewy, for example, right, or whatever else calls to you, that's just naturally getting your larynx moving up and down. That saliva is also helping to um, hydrate the voice as well. So just sleep, a physical warm-up, um, lots of water, and a chewy breakfast, mm -hmm. you're already in a good space. So we talk a lot about, you know, at Freeform, we talk a lot about routines and accountability and sticking to those things that help us get into that space to work out healthily. Yeah. I would say the exact same thing about the voice. If I don't do even just one of those four things that I mentioned, yeah. I'm in a different spot. So all of the you know, vocal warm-ups that I could give you that we all sound a little yes. silly doing, none of those are going to have their full effect if I forget one of those first four things that I just mentioned. Right. So even though I can get my voice to a decent place if I've had a bad sleep, 
it's never gonna be the same if I had a really, really bad sleep. You're tired, you're more lethargic, the, you don't have the energy to get your voice out into the room so that it carries for your clients. So those four things are really, really important. And then from there, something a little bit more detailed is the food that you eat. Mm -hmm. Thinking about maybe avoiding spicy foods, for example, mm -hmm. cause reflux. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody has reflux caused by spicy foods. For, for me, it's all about finding what foods trigger that reflux. And the crazy part is there's a kind of reflux that is actually called silent reflux. There's good old heartburn where you really feel it in your esophagus, but then there's that sort of subtle one where you just sort of feel it coming up into your throat in the back of your mouth. That's called the silent reflux and that's the one that can really sort of seep into the trachea and hit the vocal folds and dry them out. So just pay attention to what foods trigger that for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, just doing some basic voicing. Some hums, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just going up and down your range. Some good old lip trills, things like that. Um, I have a million different little exercises that people could do if they're, if they're willing. But just making sure that you've experienced the voice waking up before you arrive to work with your clients. Mm -hmm. If the first time you speak that day is with your clients, you've already set yourself off on the wrong foot. Right. Because now you're in a big space, music's playing, you're trying to be confident for your client, you're using your best big voice. If you do that cold, just like trying to deadlift cold, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. So those are all of my little tricks that I would use. Yeah. And if anybody wants some really specific voice warm-ups, they are welcome to reach out and I'm happy to give them. But you don't have to do a million different voice warm-ups if you do those first four things. Sleep, hydrate, chewy breakfast, and um, uh, move. move. Thank you. I'm forgetting my own order here. And just moving your body. Yeah. 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 yeah and the best thing about that is those are things we generally recommend anyways right for general overall health so the fact that it's great for your voice as well as the rest of your body is, is perfect but as we know personal trainers and anybody who works in a health related field we can often be guilty of not doing the things that we ask our clients yes, to do exactly. and so the reason it's so important for us is because it reminds us when we don't do it it reminds us why our clients don't do it mm -hmm. so there's empathy involved there too it reminds you that sometimes those routines that we ask of our clients, we don't always adhere to. We do our best, of course, and people are human. So I also think there's a lot of empathy involved in that routine and thinking of yourself as needing to do a warm up for your voice is just like what you ask your clients to do for homework. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, something else that you mentioned earlier, alcohol and mm -hmm. uh, coffee. Yes. <laughs> The nectar of life. Yes. <laughs> I don't even drink alcohol or coffee, actually. No. I've never had coffee in my life. Oh, really? Never, ever, which shocks people. Yeah. And I stopped drinking about eight and a half years ago. It was just a choice I made. Yeah. And something that I decided to do as I was becoming a yoga teacher and as I was starting to sing and act a lot more professionally. I just found that when you wake up having not had it, even, even a drink of alcohol the night before, your voice is so much more ready to go. Mm -hmm because you haven't dried your throat out. Yeah, well, actually, alcohol dries your entire system out, yeah. as does caffeine, right? So it's something to think about. Hydrating extra if you need that shot of espresso. <laughs> Staying true to drinking water if you're enjoying a tasty beverage the night before, or you go for, for lunch with colleagues and you have a, a tasty beverage with your colleagues. Just pairing that with some water is so 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 important because in those first four things that I mentioned one of which was hydration it's almost like a, a deficit and surplus thing right for yeah. every every alcoholic drink you have you're going into a deficit right so you have to sort of match that to even just get yourself back to neutral let alone to really being hydrated mm -hmm. yeah. depending on how many clients you have depending on the extremity with which you have to use your voice Live your life. Enjoy. Don't become too, <laughs> too OCD about this. You know, enjoy your life. But remember, if you don't have your health, you don't have a job is key. Mm -hmm. So I recommend thinking about the timing of your alcohol, the timing right. of your caffeine, and how much water you pair with it. Yeah. Because 
They are classic, classic dehydrators. The other thing that they do, in different ways, but in similar enough ways, is they lower your inhibitions. Mm -hmm. Alcohol, because you're feeling more free than you usually are when you start to drink alcohol, and caffeine, because you have so much more energy. But of course, remember, caffeine doesn't actually give you energy, it just blocks your adenosine receptors. Right? So people think that caffeine literally gives you energy. What it really does is it stops you from knowing that you're tired. Right. And so when we are not tired and we think we have lots of energy, we can overuse our body too. Mm -hmm. When we are enjoying a night with alcohol, we can just you know, let our you know, inhibitions down and we start to speak more loudly than we should or use our voice or sing karaoke or you know, do the things that you do. So in different ways, they often tell us that we can do things that maybe we couldn't do if we were actually in a good space. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, they, they, they lower our inhibitions in different ways. Right. Um, and yeah. yeah, that fact about caffeine, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Something that I've never heard of before, having yeah. it described that way, yeah. that uh, it doesn't give you energy, but it just... It know, blocks the feeling that you're tired. You're tired. Yeah. So not mm -hmm. only are you, you know, making yourself do more than you probably should, yeah. but you don't know it, right? So you don't really know when to stop and when your body needs to, to rest. Absolutely. You Especially if you keep it. drinking it. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And rest is important. Oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's amazing the different substances that can impact not only your day-to-day -day life, but what we do as professionals who need our own bodies and our own voices and our own minds to be in good shape, literally, pardon the yeah. pun, but in good shape to do what it is that we do. Right. The other thing to consider as well is um, something like ibuprofen or aspirin. Ibuprofen and aspirin are defined as blood thinners. That's what they do. They, they thin the blood. And when your blood is flowing, you think you can lift a lot more. You think you can speak a lot more loudly than you can. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the structure to support that extra engagement just because you're feeling good because the blood's flowing more than it usually is. So that's something else to consider. Ibuprofen stays in your system for about 48 hours-ish. We generally say 36 to 48 hours. Aspirin can stay in your system for over a week. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. It's in a very intense, that's why it's used in heart attack situations. Yeah. It's a very intensive blood thinner. Ibuprofen, parts per million wise, gets out of your system a little bit more quickly. But for the 24 to 48 hours after you take ibuprofen, your blood is going to be flowing more than it usually is. And so there have been really interesting stories about musicians who were going on tour, yeah. right, from stadium to stadium, who had a headache, they took an ibuprofen, they sang a show, and they blew out their voice. Because again, they feel good, everything's feeling fine, the blood's flowing, so they, you know, they belt out that note. Yeah. But if they don't actually have the structure to handle that high note, they just think they do, that's something else to consider as well. So just all of these things you start to pay attention to, wow, what have I been putting in my body? Which is something we ask of our clients all the time. Mm -hmm. But I am offering with love <laughs> mm -hmm. to challenge us as colleagues in PT to think about what we put in our body and what that does to our instrument, right? Our body is our instrument yeah. for what we do. And so any substance, any drug can affect your voice. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So there are all sorts of things that I consider in my life and people always say, oh, you have such a clean life. I say, yeah. well, <laughs> I have a life that asks that of me. Yeah. I need my voice to be ready to go, whether it's because I'm acting, whether it's because I'm singing or in my other world, it's because I'm training people. Yeah. And as a teacher, I need to be able to talk. And as a teacher, I need to be able to demonstrate these exercises with a body that is hopefully as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. Now we all have our coping mechanisms, of course. Days where we're tired, days where we just have a super busy schedule, maybe we don't do as much demonstrating. You know, There are other ways to cope. But I would offer that these considerations from a substance standpoint, from a hydration standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint, those really affect your, your delivery of your own professionalism as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and again, there's parallels to 
uh, our work with our clients, right? And the conversations that we have with them. There's choices and concessions that need to be made sometimes if you're trying to achieve a certain outcome. And uh, yeah, you know, you have to weigh for yourself what trade-offs you're willing to make and, and what you're able to sort of uh, give up if you have to give something up and in order to um, you know, be optimal in, in certain areas of your life. So. It's priorities. Yeah, exactly. Making that prioritization of what's yeah. really important. And of course, it's not an all or nothing thing. No. I'm not trying to sit here getting everybody to stop coffee yeah, or yeah. stop alcohol and please live, enjoy your life. <laughs> please yeah. enjoy. It's about, it's sort of like, you know, your emails. What email is really important to you? <laughs> what can wait? Mm -hmm. what, where are you focusing the energy mm -hmm. to make sure that you do what you need to do? And so just like we say with our clients, I remember actually um, two of our colleagues were talking about how they just asked a client to get two cream and two sugar in their coffee instead of four cream and four sugar. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So maybe the night before you have a lot of clients, have one beer mm -hmm. instead of two beers. Yeah. Have one cup of coffee in the morning if you can handle it instead of two. Or what, there are those little things that we ask of our clients. Mm -hmm. In the words of one of my heroes, Dr. Johnetta B. Cole, she always says, I ask nothing of you that I haven't asked of myself. Yeah. So that empathy, that human approach, because personal training is just humans. It's a humane process if we let it be, hopefully. <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's the idea, is to be as human and humane as possible. So that gives me the empathy for my clients mm -hmm. to know that I've had things that I've been able to change. There are things that I can't change. Mm -hmm. Those are where my priorities lie. Same for them. Right. And so approaching them with this all or nothing approach, which isn't free form's way, so I'm preaching to the choir here, but that, that all or nothing approach is rarely going to work for people. So that wonderful example our colleagues gave of, okay, maybe just two cream, two yeah. sugar. Well, all those calories in one week, that makes a difference. Yeah. My feeling is the same. If you can get an extra half hour of sleep, and drink one extra glass of water in the morning and take a little bit more time to chew your food, you're going to have so much more voice for your day. Right. Even if it's an extra half hour. But here at Freeform, we do 30-minute sessions. That extra half hour could mean the difference between that last client getting the healthiest you yeah. Or not. So it, it, I love that parallel you just drew, drew because I totally agree with that. It's, mm -hmm. it's asking of us what we ask of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. Which is a lot like life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark, earlier you mentioned that we have to be cognizant about how we're, you know, potentially straining and, and holding our voice mm -hmm. in when we're lifting heavy mm -hmm. weights. Yep. Um, and how lifting heavy impacts our larynx and you know how our larynx can impact the way we lift absolutely as well absolutely so yeah for for us as trainers and when we're working with, with our clients um, are there any cues that might be beneficial for us to use on ourselves or our clients to kind of like lift a little bit more healthfully for our, our larynx absolutely and what's great is when you lift more healthily for your larynx, it's my contention that you're lifting more healthily for your whole body. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I say that I always recommend to personal trainers, and I know you and I are both very interested in language, and I don't mean English or French, I mean like the words that we use to cue people. So what I say is let the ease of the exhale be the ease of the lift. Mm. Show your body how to lift by how you exhale. Because if the exhale is smooth, the lift is going to be a lot smoother. Yeah. And in the last year of being a personal trainer, I can tell you anecdotally, 100% conversion with my clients. 100% of the time, they go, oh, if I mimic the smoothness of my breath mm -hmm. with the smoothness of the exercise and vice versa, it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about why that's happening. Yeah. Why is and that happening? Just to be clear for any clients, you know, <laughs> not all of our cues are meant to make things harder, <laughs> right? Yeah. There we go. See, sometimes we want it to be easier. Yes, exactly. And what's interesting is, no, I love that you said that because when I say easier, it's more, it's easier psychologically, yeah. but it can actually often make it harder physiologically. Mm -hmm. And here's why. When you do that, you're using the right muscles now. 
because when the larynx doesn't take over and try to do that piano <laughs> lifting pian the piano analogy I used, you all of a sudden have to actually engage the muscles that we're trying to get out of that exercise. Yeah. So the body flows, but when you feel that engagement in the actual muscles we're trying to work, you go, yeah. oh, I was lifting from somewhere else. Yeah. How often have we seen someone doing a pull, for example, and it's just coming from the traps? Yeah. It's not coming from between those shoulder blades, right? It's just coming from the tops of the shoulders. One of the things that's often correlated with that is holding your breath. Mm. Because the neck and the larynx naturally just want to tighten up to help you with the lift. It's an incredibly strong organ. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it's doing. Beyond the fact that psychologically it feels better, again, physiologically it doesn't always feel better, yeah. but the reason is because now we're engaging the muscles that we actually want to engage. And I promise you, to PTs here or elsewhere, that if you look at when the neck actually lets go, because if you're doing a squat, you don't need your neck. Yeah. You really don't. All of a sudden, the actual glutes that we really want to engage are finally engaging. Mm -hmm. And so it shifts so many things. And this is my yoga background coming out, but that flow state, really getting into that place where there's no excess tension. There's the right amount of tension in the right amount of places mm -hmm. has always been demonstrated by the right amount of flow to the breath. Because if we hear, even if it's quiet, if we hear that that audible exhale, that mean, or that quiet exhale, I should say, that means the vocal cords are open. That means we haven't shoved them together for that that added push from the larynx. That feeling of exhale mm -hmm. just gets so many things in line right. for me. So I really recommend that you cue with the breath as much as you cue with the form because the form gets better when the yes. breath is better and the breath gets better when the form, you know, it, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It really does help each other. And just thinking about that kind of language, we, we often love push, lift, you know, these really strong, and not only we listen to the strain in my voice when I did that, yeah. demonstrating through language that is maybe a little softer, doesn't mean it will be easier physiologically. It might actually get a little bit harder for the client, mm -hmm. but they're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. And when we feel better, we're more motivated. When we're more motivated, we stick to the routines that we ask them to do. Yep. And when they stick to the routines, they're more likely to come back. But if it's a struggle, if their voice, if their neck is doing all that work for them, they feel psychologically and emotionally that tension. What we want is we want tension in the muscles because tension is what makes muscles grow. Yeah. But tension in the breath, tension in the mind, tension in the heart, that keeps more people away than I think we give it credit for. Yeah. So when people talk about the language that I use, and if I, if I may share this about myself, you know, people say, oh, you're not intimidating in the gym, yeah. but you still work me really hard. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate compliment for me. That's, I'm, I'm okay, good, <laughs> I can retire. <laughs> you know, I'm good, I've done my job. I want people to be gently strong. Yeah. We're not proving, you know, we don't have to prove anything that we don't need to prove around here. So I would just encourage you to think about the way that the words that you use, mm -hmm. how that, what that inspires in the body. And I know we're going to talk about that in another episode sometime about the language that we use when we train. But just get them to imagine that the ease of their breath is the smoothness of the exercise mm -hmm. and I promise you I, I, every time I ask that of my clients yes. <laughs> they're, they're thrilled they go that wasn't easy but it was easier yes exactly and yeah it's not that you know it, it should be effortful but in the right ways right and you shouldn't feel strain anywhere uh, yeah everything should be sort of like coordinated and working together seamlessly working together and then we know we're working from the right place mm -hmm. right yep. and there's certain exercises as isolated as a bicep curl but most exercises come from more than one place yep. even accessory exercises 
They're not as compound as the big ones, but there's very few exercises that are completely isolated, exactly. <laughs> right? Because as we know, I mean, the wrist is even involved with the bicep because that rotates the wrist. You know, there's all this nerdy stuff about what the body does. So a truly isolated exercise is actually very difficult. Mm -hmm. It doesn't so, really exist. It doesn't no. really <laughs> exist, right, physiologically? Yeah. So if we can get them understanding that you're not just pushing something, but where does that push come from? I can't tell you the difference I see if they literally concentrate on that being where the push starts from their exhale is all of a sudden not doing the work yeah. it's not working as hard because the neck is actually <laughs> relaxed mm -hmm. so I'm just constantly fascinated yeah. at the lack of inclusion yeah. of this super strong organ oh, called the yeah. larynx in our work as PTs but I'm also constantly amazed that when you acknowledge it and notice it the difference is night and day. Right. And the form and the ease and the freedom in that effort. Yeah. As you say, because we need tension to grow, that effort becomes so much more directed and concentrated and, and flowing. And I, I've loved watching mm -hmm. the difference. It's so satisfying. And you see their eyes, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the light, light, the light bulb comes on. Comes on and we're, as teachers, that's our favorite thing. Yes. Yeah. Watching our students, because yeah. I think of my clients as students in yeah. a way. Watching our students and clients have that light bulb moment, that's why we do this. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really, really fun for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah, I, I have a feeling that, that we just barely scratched the surface. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know if we, we need to have a five-hour long podcast. But... <laughs> Probably not. No. Uh -huh. Probably so, not. So, yeah, I definitely would love to uh, dive into this further in, in a future episode but uh yeah thanks mark for, for joining me in introducing me and hopefully you know a lot of our viewers into this new world of the, the larynx mm -hmm. and how how important our voice is in our day-to-day -day lives and hopefully uh, we'll be able to take better care of ourselves and our voices here's hoping <laughs> thank you so much